Hello friends, I'm Atul Dahale and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we are going to look at one very famous game known as the evergreen game of chess. It was played by Adolf Anderson. Adolf Anderson was one of the greatest players of the 19th century. And in my previous video, I have analyzed another famous game of Anderson that is known as the immortal game of chess. You can find that game's link in the i section above or in my playlist that is classical games playlist i will surely recommend you to watch that video i'm quite sure you will love that game so getting back to the game the game which we are going to look at was played between anderson as white and dufresne as black in berlin 1852 the game started with the evans gambit and white quickly completed his development kept his king on the right side of the board like is the castled and to reply this black should also have castled in the position but he did not castle he kept his king in the center of the board and he tried to create some counter chances on the flanks but white opened up the game with a nice and beautiful knight sacrifice in the center of the board and what happened in the game i'll not tell you right now so stay till till the end to find out what happened in this game why this game is called as the evergreen game of the chess and without further ado let's get started the game started with e4 that is anderson's move his opponent who, who was different he started with e5 knight of 3 knight to the c6 bishop to the c4 bishop to the c5 and anderson play very aggressive move that is the b4 so bishop into b4 and this opening is known as the evans gambit so in this position what white is trying to do is like he is sacrificing a pawn on the flank but in return he will play c3 now because now he will be getting more control in the center of the board because the c3 pawn is there so in this position black players usually play bishop to the c5 or bishop e7 or also bishop a5 which is played in this game he played bishop to the a5 and white played d4 why is he playing this move because even if uh, here in this position black captures on d4 white is not going to capture the pawn on d4 with the pawn because the pawn is pinned so why is he even doing this thing okay we'll figure it out and another possibility from black side is to play d6 that is a very safe option but he took the challenge he captured on d4 and here white as i told you did not wanted to capture the pawn on d4 with the pawn he wanted to castle he just wants to complete his development as quickly as possible that's what he is doing and now in this position black played d3 so will you capture the pawn on d3 obviously not right anderson also did not wanted to do that he wanted to take advantage of his development and the pawn on f7 is little bit weak so he created a battery with his queen and the bishop to attack the pawn on f7 now. He is neglecting the pawn on d3 because the pawn on d3 is not going anywhere. So black defended the pawn with queen to the f6. And now in this position to dislodge this queen from f6 square white played a nice move. He played e5 attacking the queen. Now you will say that okay the pawn on e5 can be captured with the knight. But no if he captures with the knight then after knight into e5 queen into e5. The pawn on f7 will still fall and the king on e8 will be not so good in that position. Okay, maybe he can play king f8 but then we can say that uh, this position is much better for white because black's right to castle has already been broken. So that is not something which black wants to do. He played queen to the g6 in this position and now white played very simple move rook to the e1 just developing the rook and also protecting the pawn on e5. And it is also going to do a very big role in the game that because the king is on the e8 square and the rook on e1 square. We will figure it out why that rook on e1 is very important. So here in this position black played knight g7. Maybe he wants to castle in this position and complete the development. So white played bishop to the a3. Just in case if black castles in this position the knight on e7 will be plain. But still I think in the game black did not castle in this position but castling was an, one of the best moves in this position because completing the development and safeguarding your king is a very important thing but in this position black thought he needs to create some counterplay he needs to distract these pieces that's why he played b5 in this position and now white captured the pawn and he brought his rook on the b8 square attacking the queen so what will you do now okay anderson played a simple move queen to the a4 Still his bishops are eyeing towards black's king and this rook is also there. So here in this position also black should have castled in this position and 
should have tried to safeguard his king, but he did not do that. He wanted to create his own counter plays. That's why he played bishop to the b6. Now this uh, bishop is attacking the f2 square. And also there was one trap. If black castled on the previous move, then white has uh, one move that is bishop into e7. And then if knight into e7, the bishop on a5 is hanging. So it was almost practically forced for black to move the bishop. That's why he played bishop to the b6. Now the f2 pawn is a little bit uh, weak. So, white's knight is not yet developed, his rook is also not developed, so he played knight to the b2 square. And here in this position, black played bishop to the b7. Now he is trying to create a kind of attack on white's king because his queen is also there on g6 and attacking the g2 pawn. And he is also threatening a little bit small tricks like this knight will move and the bishop will capture on the f3 square. And uh, there might be some counterplay because knight into e5 is also one of the threat. So in this position white understood that thing and he said like okay I can put the knight in the center of the board and let's see what happens. So he plays the knight on e4. What is really happening now? The queen which was supporting the d3 pawn is not now supporting the knight is centrally placed and we know this thing that when the knight is centrally placed it can jump over on f6 and d6 square and black's king is still in the center of the board. So in this position, black should have castled. That was one of the safest option for him, but he did not do it. He kept the king in the center of the board and he played queen to the f5. Okay, as the queen is played on f5, white played bishop into d3. Now there is x-ray attack on the queen and knight d6 check is threatened. So black removed his queen from that diagonal. He played queen to the h5. And now in this position, you can see that uh, black's king is in the center, white's all pieces are ready now. His rook is also there on this file. This bishop is attacking on this diagonal. The queen can also be handy on this diagonal. So what will you play? And Anderson understood that the dynamics of the position. He played a very beautiful move with his knight. He played knight to the f6 check. Giving a check that is okay, but he's also attacking the queen on h5. So it is almost forced for black to capture the knight. So what is really happening after capturing? One thing is that the rook's file is now opened up. Okay, the knight on e, e7 is being attacked with the pawn. So black thought, okay, I will also create some counterplay against white's king. And he played rook to the g8, which is a good move. He's threatening now queen into f3, attacking the knight because the knight on f3 is now free of cost because the pawn on g2 is pinned. Black, white cannot capture back with the g into f3. So what to do? Should white just save the knight on f3 or should he play something else? And Anderson chose something else. He decided that in this game, his rook on a1 is not participating. If the rook on a1 comes into the game, then black's king will be in danger. So he plays rook a d1. This is actually a very phenomenal move because what white is doing, he is just offering black to capture the knight on f3. Why? We will figure it out now. Black also accepted the challenge and he played queen into f3. But just to let you know, black should have played rook to the g4 in this position, which should have stopped all the sacrificial play which happened in the game. Okay, But he was not in that mood. He wanted to checkmate white's king because on the next move, queen into g2 is the checkmate is threatened. So in this position, is Anderson in danger? No. He had something beauty, beautiful in his mind. He played rook into e7 check. And now black has two options. Either he can play knight into e7 which happened in the game. Or he can play king to the d8. And after that rook into d7 was a good move. If king into d7 then bishop f5 check. And if king to the e8 goes then white has a nice move. That is bishop to the d7. And if now king to the d8 then bishop into c6 check and now this uh, queen will be lost and black's king is also very weak but in the game he played knight into e7 in this position and that led to a very beautiful stunning queen sacrifice which is queen into d7 check and if black king captures the queen which is almost forced then white has bishop f5 check king to the e8 now bishop to the d7 check king to the d8 and now bishop e7 is a checkmate. 
So this is a very beautiful combination which Anderson played which started with knight f6 check and then queen also was sacrificed and that's why this game has been in the hearts of all the chess lovers more than 150 years. So I hope you love this evergreen game and uh, you will share this video also with your friends and if you are not subscribed to my channel till now do subscribe to my channel for future updates. Thank you for watching the video. We'll meet again. Bye.